Dear students, in our last lecture, we said that we will be dealing a lot of terminologies of mathematics to achieve our machine learning goals. And the best way to start that discussion is looking into the vectors. So here I have created a mind map which is adapted from this book on mathematics of machine learning and I, you will find the link in the description below where we try to see that how various mathematical concepts are related to each other and why we need to understand all of these to reach our final goal. So we will be talking a lot about vectors and these vectors actually form the basis of metrics and whenever we work in data sciences most of the data is represented in form of a matrix. Now these metrics and vectors when combined together they represent some sort of linear mapping that means if you transform or if you multiply a given vector or given set of numbers by a matrix or another vector space you are translating it into the sort of transforming it into a linear space and hence they are also called as linear mapping. Now vectors whenever we do some operation on vectors we are doing operation in a way that vector still remains a vector in a given space and the two operation that we would be dealing here would be addition and multiplication by a scalar so multiplication and addition by addition with vector and multiplication by a scalar and by closure we would mean if we apply these two fundamental operation on any given vector we should stay in the vector space and then this vector space in turns represent the linear mapping. Also one of the key properties that we will understand of vectors is their linear dependence. How we can say that two vectors are linearly dependent or independent and then this linear dependence or absence of dependency would inform the choice of basis and this basis is finally used for dimensionality reduction. Similarly when we talk about linear mapping Linear mapping directly helps us in classification which we will learn with the help of support vector regressions and then these matrices also represent certain systems of equations and these system of equations can be solved using Gaussian elimination which also gives us row echelon form or reduced echelon form or echelon form to deal with which are super convenient to solve complex system. Now I understand these are a lot of terminologies but we will go one by one and try to understand what they all mean and we will start from the first word that what this word vector would actually mean in the context of our discussions. So let us get started. So whenever we talk about vectors in our high school we have learned this notion that anything that has a direction as well as magnitude we say that it's a vector and the typical example is a geometric vector or a two dimensional vector which you can draw on a Cartesian coordinate. So let us say that we have x-axis, we have y-axis and we say that plot a point 2 comma 3 with help of a vector. So you will say that from origin we will go 2 in the x, 3 in the y and wherever we end up this is going to be the vector. And if we have to calculate its magnitude we can always compute its magnitude which we will deal separately as norms but now you have said that yes there is a direction associated from the origin there is a magnitude uh, or uh, associated with that which can be calculated as 3 square plus 2 square and its square root and that would give us both direction as well as magnitude. Now here we will get a little bit more abstract because when we talk about data sets we are not specifically dealing with the geometrical aspect only we may also be dealing with some polynomials for example if we have a series of numbers which are arranged in some way 2 minus 3 4 5 7 and this would form a dimension of let us say n cross 1 and if you multiply this n cross 1 or in fact it's transpose that means we take the numbers like 2 minus 3 4 5 7 with x1 x2 x3 x4 and x5 and when we do this multiplication we would end up with something called as the polynomial because there are multiple terms associated here x1 x2 x3 and polynomial of various degrees can be derived by this simple multiplication where you are multiplying two vectors in accordance with the the rule of matrix multiplication where inner dimensions should agree. 
Now that would mean that although plotting this particular vector on a map would be hard, but still we cannot deny that this is a vector. This is a vector uh, which can be represented as a real num a, a vector consisting of real numbers of dimensions n cross one. Since this one is explicit is is a redundant quantity in a sense because when we are talking about vectors, we are essentially talking about one uh, single column tuples and hence we say that this can simply be represented as belonging to r raised to power n. Now this is a typical form that we will use a lot to represent our data sets and specifically when we talk about collection of various vectors of size n and if we are talking about m such vectors what we will say that here we will have 1, 2, 3 all the way up to m collection of vectors where each of them belongs to r raised to power n and when we put them together or stack them together we end up with the matrix of size n cross m. Now many of us are also familiar with usage of these vectors and, and specifically how, how a system of linear equations can be represented in using this vectorial notation. For example, there is a system of equation x1 plus x2 plus x3 equal to 3, x1 minus x2 plus 2x3 equal to 2, 2x1 plus 3x3 equal to 1. And now if we want to write this in certain form, we can always say that x1 is multiplied by 1 1 2 plus x2 is multiplied by 1 minus 1 0 and x3 is multiplied by 1 2 3 and this is equal to 3 2 1 and now if we have to solve this we can say that the solution is simply x1 c1 plus x2 c2 plus x3 c3 equal to certain field which is again a vector of three dimension equal to b. Now to distinguish vectors from single real numbers, let us say that number two, number three, we often either use the symbol of arrow on top of them or in certain textbooks we write these particular term in a little bit of a bolder notation. So wherever you see some thickened notation written that means that they are not talking about the numbers but they are talking about the vectors or in some cases you will see this arrow heads being used as part of the notation. Now the point here is that we say that x1, x2, x3 in this particular case they are not either uh, having arrows on their top of, your, of their head or not neither written in, in bold letters so they essentially represent a particular real value whereas c1, c2, c3 and b they represent the notation in vectorial form. Now this particular equation we have been familiar with there are three equations three variables and we can really find whether there is a solution or where there is a no solution and also when we talk about the geometric interpretation if there are two variables and two equations you can simply plot them on the graph and find the point of intersection and say that this is a typical output of particular uh, a typical solution for a particular system of equations alternatively we can also write these equations in the matrix form that means we can always say that let us collect all the coefficients into a matrix where size of this matrix would be number of equations times number of parameters multiply by x1 x2 x3 and that would be equal to b1 b2 b3 and if we have to solve x1 x2 x3 we simply take an inverse and get our answers now this solving the equations may seem very trivial task which we are used to do so many times since our high school however when we deal with linear algebra we find new and creative ways to solve the system of equations and draw various inferences and sometimes these solutions help us gain much more understanding into the domain and range of a particular function that is what could be the inputs and what could be the relevant outputs and we will learn all those entry cases of solving these equations using some very interesting 
examples. Now, needless to say, since many of you might be familiar with vector addition and vector subtraction, so for example, you can only add two vectors which are of same size. So for example, if you add two vectors of uh, represented of, of m dimensions basically, r raised to power m or, or which belong to an m dimensional space, then the output would again be r to the power m. If you multiply a particular vector by some scalar, the output would still be in the same space. Think about it. You have a two dimensional vector 1, 2 and you add another two dimensional vector 3, 1. This would become 4, 2 and so on. Again, I am right now I am using this two dimensional, three dimensional in a loose sense. But once we define the dimensionality after learning spans, we would be very careful and we will simply say that this vector belongs to an m dimensional space rather than saying this is an m dimensional vector and so on. Okay, if this is clear. Similar thing applies to the matrices. If you have collection of various vectors put together in form of matrices, let us say A and B, you can only add these two vectors if they are of same dimension. That means if they both are M cross N, M cross N, only then you can add it. However, in many programming languages, you would see that an M cross M vector is added to an M cross 1 vector based on the feature called as broadcasting where in broadcasting we don't do anything special but we repeat this particular vector n times to make the size consistent before we add them and many programming languages do it for us also a quick refresher two matrices can only be multiplied if their inner dimensions are same so you can only multiply a and b if they are of shape m cross n and n cross q that means the inner dimension should agree so that the product becomes m cross q and we say that we have followed the matrix multiplication here and we will do some when we do we will do some examples or you might remember it from your high school or or from 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 your secondary school so we will not repeat those particular examples but we will we will use this particular concept multiple times. Also, let me introduce another term which we call as identity matrix. So identity matrix is basically a matrix which have one along the diagonals, all the elements where their i is equal to j or i all the elements along i i i are called as identity uh, are called as diagonal elements and when they are all equal to one and everywhere else we have zero this has to be a square matrix we call this particular matrix as an identity matrix in notation we often represent matrix as r raised to power n cross n where we mean that we are in the real space and the, the size of this particular matrix is n rows times n columns so this is some of the basic concepts that we will use again and again and before we go into that let us start with right away with an interesting example that how this knowledge of matrices and vectors can be used to solve certain equations and later on these solutions would acquire some special name which we will frequently encounter in machine learning and data science literature. So first interesting example that we are going to talk about is that we will try to solve a system of equation x1 plus 0x2 plus 8x3 minus 4x4 equal to 42 then 0x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 plus 12x4 equal to 8 and we are interested to find how many solutions you have if you remember in high school mathematics we would say that there are two equations and there are four variables and hence we cannot solve it or there there is no solution that exists for this particular system however that is not correct there are in fact infinite solution for this particular system if we declare two variables as free variables that means we will set them to zero and using those other two equations we will solve the system of equations and the kind of solution that we get by setting two variables equal to zero specifically 
we call such solutions as the particular or special solution now what these special solution are let us say we say that let us set up x3 and x4 equal to 0 and then we can simply say that x1 has to be 42 and x2 has to be 8 if you just look at these two equations and this becomes a particular solution. Similarly, you can set x1 and x3 equal to 0, x2 and x4 equal to 0 and you can try it in various combinations and you will keep on getting the special solution. However, this is not the only solution of this particular system of linear equations. We have to identify all other systems which are we call as non-trivial solutions or general solutions and we will see that how we can do that. Now if we have a system of equation which we say that we can represent as a product of matrix and vector and say that this is equal to b. Now if I add a 0 on this side it is not going to take anything away but it gives me an interesting thinking point that means everything that satisfy ax equal to 0 should also be part of the system of solutions of ax equal to b. And to do that, what I can do, I will again try to solve this particular equation in a little creative way. Recall that we said that when we multiply the column vector by x1, x2 by the corresponding column vector, x3 by corresponding column vector and so on and we equate it to b, we can calculate what is the value of x1, x2, x3 as the coefficients of these column vectors that we get. Now even in this case what we try to do we try to find that which particular columns are independent and which particular columns are dependent. So we will begin our hunt for independent versus dependent column. So by choice I took this example to be very simple where identifying these dependent and independent columns are easier but later on we will find very interesting way to automate this search for dependent versus independent columns which will form the basis of our discussion around span and the, the with the vector basis. So if you look at this particular form we can say that this 8 and 2 can be represented as 8 times column 1 plus 2 times column 3. If you just look at the coefficients, so we can say that if you multiply the C1 which are the coefficients or whatever terms that the first column would have corresponding to x1 by 8 and second columns coefficient by 2 C2 that should be equal to C3 because we can write that particular system of equations in a form of C1 x1 plus C2 x2 plus C3 x3 plus C4 x4 equal to 0. Remind it we are going to behind the general solutions now and we say that we are interested in solving ax equal to 0. Hence c1 would correspond to the coefficients of corresponding to, to, the, to the first uh, first column, c2 corresponds to second column and so on. Now this would imply we can always say that 8 times c1 plus 2 times c2 minus 1 times c3 plus, one plus 0 times c4 is equal to 0 and isn't this the case that we discussed that if we can determine what are these coefficients these are going to be the solutions also so that would be the x1 this would be x2 this would be x3 and this would be x4 and hence one solution that we get is 8 times 2 minus 1 times 0 now if you multiply this particular vector by any real number where lambda 1 belongs to r that is always going to be the solution of this particular system. It's, a, it's like multiplying both sides of, uh, of an equation where one side is zero by any constant. So the solutions are not going to change. So this is the one particular solution that we 
one general solution that we get by this simple calculation. Similarly, if you look at the third or the, the last row which has the coefficients of minus 4 and 12. So this is our C4 minus 4 and 12. Again we can say that C4 can be written as minus 4 times C1 plus 12 times C2 and we don't really have to go to C3. So we can say that if you multiply this by 0 you are going to get your answer. So here again we say that minus 4 times C1 plus 12 times C2 plus 0 times C3 minus 0 times C4 equal to 0 and hence the another solution is given by minus 4, 12, 0 uh, and in fact here it would be 1 because we are bringing it on this side and 1 times lambda 2. So basically we have derived that the total solution set for x vector is not only the particular solution that we got as 42800 plus there are some general solutions also that we have to consider which in this case are 8 to minus 1 0 and this would be lambda 2 minus 4 12 0 1. Now you can check it yourself. Take any value of lambda in the real space. Take any value of lambda 2 in real space. Try to plug these values and you will say that these values will always satisfy the equation Ax equal to B. Now one thing that really enabled us to do this particular calculation in such an easy way is the way these coefficients were arranged. If you look at the coefficient matrix, it will take a very nice neat and clean form where you would have 1, 0, 0, 1 and this is followed by some numbers 8 to minus 4, 12 and you can just do mental math and do entire calculation in head to solve these equations because this particular equations are in a special form what we call as a rho echelon form. Again this is quick refresher of the various terms of linear algebra you learned in your high school but very important when we talk about any aspect of data or solving data science problems. What happens in rho echelon form? So in rho echelon form we have certain elements which we call as the pivot. That means the leading element or the leading non-zero element which are arranged in some staircase form. That means you have one here followed by zero here and the next non-zero element in this particular row is now shifted here. And we call wherever these pivot elements are occurring as the pivot columns. So this is pivot column, this is pivot column and these and these are part of the, sec, the, the second row which has already been attributed to one pivot column and hence we say that these are non-pivot columns. And what is this pivot? So the leading coefficient of a row or the first non-zero number from the left is called the pivot and it is always strictly to the right of the pivot of the row above. So for example here this is the first non-zero element and hence we will call it as a pivot. Now if we go here this is on the right this is first non-zero number in our second row this is on the right here and the first element is zero hence this qualifies to be called as the pivot and whenever the equations are arranged in such staircase form we call this particular form as a row echelon form and this row echelon form makes our life much much easier to identify both particular solution and general solution. Here is another example. Let us say that we have to solve a system Ax equal to 0 and in this case our A vector is given by 1, 3, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, 1, 0, 9, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 4 and we are asked to identify first of all whether this is in a row reduced a row echelon form or not. Now you see here this is our first leading non-zero element absolutely 
this is our first row now let us move to second row this is our first non zero element and it is strictly on the right side of the first non zero element in the first row and hence we say that indeed this is our pivot column this is our second pivot column because it consists of the pivot element and similarly this one is our third pivot column so here we have three pivots three pivot columns and the beauty of this row eclan form is that we can always express non pivot columns as linear combination of pivot columns and again this would be a big result that we will use time and again when we will go to towards understanding nullity or null spaces in the context of linear transformations now with, there is another special term which we call as reduced row eclan form in a reduced row eclan form each pivot element is one as in this case this is one this is one this is one and you know that by elementary row transformation if you divide a particular row by a constant you can always reduce this con co this constant to one without changing the properties of a particular matrix now in this case you are asked to find all the general solutions for this equation which is denoted by ax equal to 0 and again we will try to identify what are our pivot columns non pivot columns and try to express non pivot columns in form of a pivot columns to get the general solution here the three pivot columns are c1 which is given by uh, c1 which is given by 100 c2 given by 300 and c3 given by 0 1 0 and c4 given by 0 0 1 whereas c5 given by 3 9 minus 4 out of this let us mark our pivot columns we saw that from previous slide this is our pivot column this is our pivot column and finally c4 is our pivot column and the column that are marked in red they are not our pivot column so c2 and c5 they are not the pivot columns so we'll try to see that can we map c2 as function of c1 c3 c4 and c5 as a function of c1 c3 c4 and it's very easy here for example we quickly see that c2 is equal to 3 times c1 and hence we can say that 0 uh, 3 times c1 minus c2 plus 0 times c3 and 0 times c4 and 0 times c5 equal to 0 by solving this equation and we quickly say that the coefficients would be x1 c1 x2 c2 x3 c3 and so forth so and so so on and so forth so the first solution that we get is 3 Minus one zero zero zero. Similarly, to go behind second solution, we will try to express C five as a function of C one, C three, and C four, and we can see that C five can be written as three times C one plus zero times C two plus nine times C three minus four times C four, and that should that that should be it. So we can say that. This is three C one plus zero C two plus nine C three minus four C four minus C five equal to zero. And again, the columns three zero nine four minus four and minus one should be our second solution, which is lambda two three zero nine minus four and minus one. Previously, we found that the another solution was lambda one equal to three minus one followed by three zeros. and all these vectors they belong to r5 which is a five dimensional vector space of real numbers vector space so now we are introducing another term which we call as vector space and this would be our topic of discussion 
for next lecture